Well, good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's awesome to have you with us. I want to say hello to everybody joining us online this morning. Thanks for participating through that venue as well. And happy Daylight Savings Time. Woohoo! Everybody enjoy that one less hour of sleep? All right. I can tell. You're wide awake. A lot of energy here. (laughs) Last week, we started this series uh, called Irresistible. And the idea behind this uh, whole entire series is that, um, man, we introduced uh, this concept uh, when Jesus first established the church, that the church was not meant to be a holy place. The church was not meant to be a, a building. Uh, like when we, we talked about last week, when we decided to build the building, it wasn't meant to be a holy place. It was meant to be a gathering place because you and I are the church. And so the church, the, these gatherings of people were really difficult to resist. They were they were irresistible. And what's happened over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years is that some of the old things have kind of gotten added back in. And now we sometimes have a version of Christianity or a version of church or a version of faith or whatever label you want to put on it that causes people sometimes to resist. And we said this, that the things that people tend to resist about church are really most often the things the church should resist about itself. That most people aren't resisting Jesus. What they're resisting is a bad experience or the way that they were treated or uh, some type of a label that they don't fully understand. And so we just, at the beginning of this series, said, man, we want to make sure that we return to a version of faith that is irresistible because the original version was so difficult to resist. It reminded me this last week of a story. Uh, There was a Japanese soldier, and I I know I'll probably say his name wrong, but uh, Hiru Onada. Hiro Onada was a Japanese soldier during World War II, and in 1944, he was dropped off with some other soldiers to Lubang Island in the Philippines. And uh, he was told, uh, given orders, that he was under no circumstances was he to surrender or take his own life. And so uh, many men from his uh, company and from his uh, group died, and eventually he was there living by himself, and the war ended. In fact, the war, the war ended about a year later, but uh, he wouldn't believe it. He thought it was enemy, uh, the enemy trying to lie to him to get him to come out of hiding. And so then the Japanese army actually sent leaflets and airplanes, and they were dropping down tons of leaflets all over Lubang Island to, to find him so that he would understand, no, the war has come to an end. You can come out now. And instead, he saw these leaflets, found them, and determined this is uh, enemy propaganda trying to get me to come out of hiding. And so he continued to stay in hiding, and he continued to carry out guerrilla warfare. He would burn fields and kill livestock, and uh, he was doing all this kind of stuff. And, and eventually they sent letters from his family and pictures from his family, and they dropped it down, and he would see them. And again, determined this is uh, the enemy trying to uh, get me to come out of hiding. And so for 30 years... He lived this way. And finally, in 1974, February 20th, 1974, he met a a Japanese man named Norio Suzuki. And he convinced him that the war actually had ended. Now think about this. Like, could you imagine playing hide and seek with this guy? I mean, he would crush at hide and seek, right? And he finally becomes convinced that the war is over, but he still refuses to surrender himself or to go or return to Japan until his uh, commanding officer gives him the command. Fortunately, his commanding officer was still alive. They found his commanding officer, flew him to the Philippines where he met Hiru and, uh, and relieved him of his duty. And so after 30 years, he finally made his way back to Japan. He would later uh, write an autobiography called No Surrender, My 30-Year War. Absolutely fascinating story. But what I think is interesting is while his heart was in the right place, he was holding on to something that was actually holding him back from living his life. His heart was in the right place, but he was holding on to something that was holding him back. And the modern church often does the same thing. And it's not just the modern church. We've been doing this for a couple of thousand years that we want to hold on to some old things that actually hold us back from moving forward the way God wants us to. Last week, we introduced something called the temple model. And basically, a real quick review of the temple model is this. The temple model is sacred spaces, right? Holy ground, uh, the the, the holy place, uh, uh, some type of sacred building or place. And inside of that are the sacred texts. 
And the sacred texts are um, uh, scrolls or uh, inscriptions or writings of some kind that are then only read and only interpreted by the sacred men. Not everybody has access to them. Only the sacred men inside the sacred place can read and interpret and uh, tell uh, the the, um, sincere followers what the sacred texts say and what they should do and how they should live. And they tell all of the followers how to live. And if you don't like what we say, then God's going to get you. And the reason I know that is because I'm the sacred man interpreting the sacred text inside of the sacred place. And you've got to follow. And as we saw last week, when Jesus showed up on the scene, he introduced something brand new. He introduced a brand new movement. And it was not Temple Model 2.0. It was not uh, an, an upgrade, right? It was, it was not another version or of another religion. It was something completely brand new. And Jesus said, I'm going to start a brand new movement, a brand new movement. And it's going to have a whole new covenant, meaning you guys had this old covenant or this old agreement with God, and now it's going to be a brand new covenant, a brand new agreement. And then he said, uh, it's going to be a, a new ethic, a brand new ethic. There's going to be a new context for how you understand the law of Moses. And there's going to be a whole new ethic. And the new ethic is not uh, just, God, where do I stand with you? But it's going to be, as I have loved you, you should love each other. As I have loved you, you should love each other. There's a brand new way to live this out. And in the early days, Gentiles, people who were not Jewish people, flocked to the message of Jesus. This Jesus movement. Because they were so tired of the pagan religions that really weren't doing anything for them anyways. (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> right as I breathed in, I swallowed spit right down the windpipe. Uh, it's a fun experience. And then uh, a bunch of Jewish people were following Jesus as well. A bunch of Jewish people who had gone to the temple and lived their whole life making sacrifices at the temple decided, no, we're going to follow Jesus as well. And they had a very specific tension that they had to wrestle with for those that were Jewish. See, the Jewish people found it very difficult to completely abandon the law of Moses, the the Torah, uh, the law that they had grown up with. And most of them, uh, growing up in a good Jewish family in the first century, you would have memorized that by the time you were 10 years old. And you would have known all 613 laws and how they apply to your life and how you're supposed to interpret those and live. And, And so now you had people who grew up in that culture and now they're following Jesus and so they find it very difficult Jesus says I'm doing something brand new it's a new movement and a new ethic and now you have people going yeah but we grew up in this and it's very difficult in fact they saw it as sacrilegious or even irreverent to just abandon the law of Moses and so they tried to assimilate Jesus into the temple model we're going to take some Jesus we're going to we're going to keep going to the temple and offering sacrifices and to atone for our sins but at the same time we also believe in Jesus and we're going to mix and match the two and we believe Jesus died and rose again, but we, you know, we also w- need to make sure that we follow the law of Moses. We want to make sure that that stays intact. We want to make sure that we're ceremonially clean so God will accept us. And so for people who grew up in Judaism, that made perfect sense. And then along came the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was originally known as Saul of Tarsus. And he was a religious leader and he was a Pharisee. In fact, he was an all-star Pharisee. Uh, He would later describe the fact that he could out-Pharisee any of the other Pharisees. He was kind of the cream of the crop. He was uh, uh, this rock star Pharisee. And he memorized the entire law of Moses. He taught it in the synagogues. And when he heard about this Jesus movement, he heard about this sacrilegious, irreverent Jesus movement, he was like, all right, God, I got this. And he set out (laughs) to put an end to that movement. And in fact, he would travel from city to city, he got deputized to do this, and go and arrest followers of the way of Jesus, this Jesus movement called the way. And he would arrest them and throw them in prison, and he was determined to stop this Jesus movement. And then he had a supernatural encounter with God along the road, and this guy who was opposed to the Jesus movement suddenly became a follower of Jesus. And so no one understood better than Paul. The, the danger. No one understood better than Paul that Jesus was doing something brand new. No one understood better than Paul the danger of trying to mesh those two things together. And what Paul understood was this new Jesus movement was not Temple Model 2.0. This was not just another version or an upgrade. This was something entirely new. And there was danger in mixing and matching those two things. And holding on to the old while at the same time trying to embrace this new Jesus movement. 
And so on his first missionary journey, he traveled to a region of the Roman Empire called Galatia. It's a, it's a number of different cities in this region, and Paul did what he would always do, and he went to the synagogue, and he began to uh, open the scriptures and to teach them about this Jesus movement. And as he did that, Gentile people started to follow Jesus, and Jewish people started to follow Jesus, and he would form this ecclesia, this uh, gathering, this group of people, not a holy place, but a group around the person of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. And then, in this region of Galatia, after he left, he returned back to a city called Antioch, and after he left and returned, some, some other missionaries who were Jewish came behind him, and they came to Galatia. And they started to tell the people that had started following Jesus, listen, uh, Paul didn't give you the whole, the whole story. Like, he gave you a good start. He got you guys off on the right foot, but there's more to the story. So it, if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to become Jewish first. See, we're Jewish, and Jesus was Jewish, and Jesus is an extension of the Old Testament, and that just means that if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to first become Jewish and follow the law of Moses, and then you can follow Jesus. And when Paul found that out, as we're going to read today, we're going to read a portion of a letter that he wrote back to these followers of Jesus in this region of Galatia, and what he wrote to them uh, addresses this issue. And we have it in our English version. If you, if you have a, a, an English version of the New Testament, it's the, it's the book of Galatians. And really what it is, is it's a letter that Paul wrote to people living in Galatia. So they're called the Galatians, right? And in chapter 5, we see how intense and how emotional Paul really gets over this idea of mixing and matching the temple model in with the Jesus movement. And he calls those people who were going behind him and saying, no, you've got you to follow Judaism, uh, he calls them Judaizers, and uh, they're basically Jewish Christians who believe in Jesus, but they believe that Christians uh, who are Gentile, non-Jewish Christians, must first convert to Judaism in order to follow Jesus. They're holding on to something that they had grown up with, something that they had known, the temple model, and then they felt that, well, Jesus is an extension of the Old Testament, so therefore, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to do that as well. And you can imagine how complex and how difficult and how complicated that would be for Gentiles who never grew up with Judaism. And particularly for men, that meant that they had to be circumcised. So that meant a little surgery. Yeah, that's, that's a big deal. Try telling grown men, hey, listen, if you're going to follow Jesus, you just have to have a little operation. Uh, no big deal, right? And, and I, I got to thinking about it this week. Like, I was like, who, how would you even know? Is that like a serving team at the synagogue? Like, hey, we need someone to be the uh, circumcision checker. Like, who's signing up for that team, you know? And it's just this weird thing. So it was a part of their culture. It's what marked this original covenant with God. And because they were Jewish, they said, you've got to do that as well. Now, this is a really, really big deal. And so Paul finds out that these Jewish missionaries are following behind him and trying to convince them to mix and match the old the old covenant, the old law of Moses with this new Jesus movement. And he is very, very upset. And so what we're going to walk through today is his response to the followers of Jesus living in Galatia. And he gives them some warnings that I think really apply to us today as well. And the first warning he gives them is this. Number one, you cannot mix and match the temple model with Jesus. You can't mix and match this temple model with this Jesus movement. They are, they're incompatible. They don't work together. Listen to what he writes to them in chapter 5 of this document or this letter that he writes to the Galatian Christians. He says this, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Now here's a side note. If your version of Christianity doesn't help you experience freedom, you've got the wrong version. If your version of Christianity doesn't make you feel free, you've got the wrong version of Christianity. Because following Jesus leads to freedom. And so Paul says, make sure you stay free. Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. He says, listen, I, Paul, tell you this, if you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. He says, if you are counting on this thing, this practice, to somehow get you in right standing with God, then, then Christ means nothing to you. Now, here's the deal. Paul wasn't against 
the, the practice of circumcision. In fact, Paul was Jewish. He himself was circumcised. All of Jesus' initial followers were Jewish. All of them were circumcised, okay? Many of you are circumcised. In fact, if you're circumcised, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so Paul wasn't against the procedure of circumcision, but circumcision represented this old covenant, and Jesus himself declared a new covenant. And so here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, what you're doing is you're, you're ditching this new so that you can embrace the old. You're abandoning the new Jesus movement so that you can embrace this old covenant. Christ will be of no value to you because you're abandoning what is new to embrace the old. He continues, I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. He says, look, the whole idea that you can take a little bit of the temple model and a little bit of the old and mix and match it with the new, and this idea is that if I can get circumcised, now I'm good with God. He says that whole thinking, once you embrace the old, you've got to embrace all of it. You can't just pick and choose and say, I'm going to embrace the circumcision part, and now I'm good, and now I'm going to mix in Jesus, and now I'm good with that. And he goes, it doesn't work. You can't mix and match. If you're going to embrace the practice of circumcision, if you're going to embrace that as the mark of the old covenant, then you have to embrace the whole old covenant. You have to embrace all 613 laws. Don't just keep one of them and, and think that somehow that makes you in right standing with God. If, you, if that's your route to God, then you better embrace the whole thing. And you better keep all 613 laws and you better do it flawlessly. And the minute that you don't, you're ceremonially unclean and you better go to the temple and you better offer a sacrifice. But he says you are free. You are free from all that. So stay free. And he says, if, if that's your route to God, then you've fallen away from grace. Because the two are very, very different. And, and, and you've, you've abandoned Christ, and you've fallen away from grace, because grace says you don't have to do anything to earn your way into favor with God. See, it'd be kind of like this. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, after uh, this service today, you said, you know, Jeremiah, uh, I just discovered this church, and I've been, we've been coming for a while, and I just really like it and enjoy it, and, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to get you a $100 gift card to a restaurant here in town. Uh, Hong Tai would be the one, I'm just saying, hypothetically speaking. Uh, and, um, and, you, and if you said, I just, I just want to say thanks, you know, for what you do. And I was like, oh, man, thank you. I mean, that's a very kind gesture, but I can't accept that. Uh, let me pay you for that. You'd be like, no, I just want to give it to you as a gift. And I say, no, listen, let me pay you for that gift card. Let me at least give you $50 for that $100 gift card. And you'd say, no, it's a gift. I just want it to be a gift. I'll, let me give you $25 for that $100 gift card. And you'd say, oh, okay. If I paid you $25 for a $100 gift card, it is no longer a gift card. It's a discount card right? I've taken the gift out of the card. As long as I've paid you something for it, it is no longer a gift card. It is a discount card. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, grace is the hallmark of the Christian experience. It's at the center of everything that Jesus is about. Grace, grace means undeserved, unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You didn't do anything to earn it. Grace says God sees you as you are with all of your past, with all of your failures, with all of your mistakes, with all of your baggage, and he accepts you and loves you. That's grace. And Paul says, look, grace is undeserved. It's unmerited. And the moment that you do something to try to earn it, the moment that you say, okay, God, I, I've done the right thing, so now we're good, right? He says, then, then you, you minimize the whole experience of grace. It's no longer grace. Now it's just about you behaving your way to God. And, and the moment you try to bargain with God, whether it's through a surgery or whether it's through your behavior, you fall away from grace. It's no longer a gift. And so Paul understood the danger of mixing and matching these two things, that the minute that you do that, the minute that you put in your behavior and that, that way of circumcision to get to God, you minimize grace. In fact, he would say this, you cannot behave your way to God. You cannot behave your way to God. Now, this isn't meant to be discouraging. This should actually be extremely encouraging, right? It means the playing field has been leveled. It means we all get to God the same way. 
So he continues in his letter. In the next verse, he says this, But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or in being uncircumcised. Paul says this this righteousness, which just means right standing with God, it isn't because of anything we have done. We haven't earned our way into this. We haven't behaved our way into this. Whether you've been circumcised or not doesn't matter. There is a new covenant, and there's no benefit in these being circumcised or uncircumcised. And and then he says something that feels extreme. If you read this just on your own with no context, you'd be like, whoa, time out, hold on. We, we need more than that. If you're, if you're not a Christian, my guess is that what Paul says next, what he writes next, probably addresses the reason that you resist church. And it probably addresses the reason that you resist Christians and the reason that you've resisted Christianity. And, and maybe someone invited you today or maybe you're checking this out online later on this week or you're joining us right now. And whatever it is, if, if for any reason you've ever resisted Church, Christianity, God, faith, religion, or whatever label you put on it. The reality is, what Paul says here, he addresses the reason that you resist church. And my guess is, uh, so much of what you've resisted about that is because so many followers of Jesus have probably resisted what Paul writes here. Here's what he says. The only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Well, hold on, Paul. Don't you mean uh, that's one of the things that counts? I mean, there's 613 laws here. Isn't that one of the 613? Paul says, nope. Okay, well, at least I know there's 10 commandments. So you're saying that's one of the 10 commandments, right? Paul says, nope. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself, working itself out in love. Faith, the belief that God has done for me, means nothing if you don't do for the you next to you. That's powerful. See, circumcision and all it represents, all it represents, the whole temple model is is very vertically oriented. It's about making sure that I'm good with God. It's all about me. Now, I want to make sure that I'm good with God. Okay, God, I, I, I did the circumcision thing. Check. So we're good now, right? Hey, God, you know what? I prayed the prayer, so we're good now, right? I quoted the thing and, and, and I recited the thing I was supposed to recite, so we're good now. Hey, God, I, I went to the Mass. We're good, right? I, I went to the confession. We're good now, right? God, I went on the mission trip, so we're good now, right? I sang the song. I, I checked the box. So, so, okay, we're good now, right? And God says, are we good? That's what grace is all about. Of course we're good. I'm fine. I'm not, you don't worry about me. We're good. You need to worry about the people around you who are created in my image. How are you treating them? The Jesus movement is not just vertical. It's horizontal. And Jesus' movement says that the way that I know I'm good with God is when I'm good with the people that are created in his image that he's put in my life. Now, here's why Paul is so passionate about this. He gives another warning. He says this, a small dose of the wrong thing corrupts the whole thing. A small dose of the wrong thing corrupts the whole thing. Listen to what he writes next to them. He says, you were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. He says, guys, you guys were doing so well. When I first came to you with this Jesus movement and I brought this to you, you embraced it. What happened? Who's confusing you? Who's who's holding you back from following the truth? He said, you mix and match a little bit and you take this single cell fungus, which is what a yeast is, by the way, yuck, and... uh, And you put a little, just a pinch of that into a big pile of dough. And you leave it there and you come back later and it's worked its way all through the dough. It's completely different. And Paul says it's the same with this, mixing and matching. A little bit of the temple model. A little bit of legalism. A little bit of just vertical only without paying attention to the horizontal. A little bit of, uh, you know, gracelessness. And it corrupts the whole thing. This isn't a blend. He says, you can't mix and match. This is a brand new thing. And you get the sense that Paul, as he writes, is getting more and more worked up as he's writing this letter. And he's getting emotional and and he's getting pretty tense. And in fact, Paul can see better than anyone else what happens when you mix and match the old model with the new. It corrupts the whole thing. And what he says next has really, you get the sense of his passion and his intensity around this. This is the rated R part. He says this. 
I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would go the whole way and castrate themselves. In other words, if circumcision is such a big deal to them, then why don't they just cut it off? That's in your Bible. You should read your Bible. Now, Paul doesn't believe circumcision is mutilation, but he's using hyperbole to describe something. He's going, look, if that's their route, then I, I, wish that, I wish that they would just go the whole way. If that's the route to getting to God, you can't mix in a little bit of legalism with the Jesus movement. And here's why Paul is so passionate about this. Because Paul was a leader in the temple model. Paul was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. He taught at the temple. He taught at the synagogue. In fact, he could out-Pharisee any of the other Pharisees, and then one day he stood as a follower of Jesus, was being stoned to death and murdered right in front of him, and he stood there and gave his approval. And that's how Paul knows better than anyone else there is so much danger when we mix the temple model with the Jesus movement. Here's what Paul knew. Leaders would become self-righteous. Because leaders then can interpret the text however they want to interpret the text. And they can interpret the text to make sure that it works for them and it doesn't work for anybody else. Oh, here's how you interpret this. And I'm on this side of the line and you're on that side of the line. And so I can interpret it this way. And that means not only would leaders become self-righteous, but followers would become hypocrites. Because as soon as you realize you're on the other side of the line, then you have to hide the messy parts of you to get on the right side of the line. This is the whole story where Jesus says, God, I thank you. You know, he tells the story of the Pharisee and a tax collector. And the Pharisee prays, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. Because the minute that you can interpret things, you interpret them so that you're good and others aren't. And when you realize that you're on the other side of that line, you've got to become a hypocrite and hide all the messy parts of you so that you can get on the right side of the line. And that the texts would be misinterpreted. And in the process, ultimately, people would be mistreated. Have you ever been mistreated? by the church? Have you ever been mistreated by someone who wears the label Christian? Have you ever been mistreated by a Jesus follower? And that's what Paul knew would happen. Here's what Paul knew. Number four, if we cling to old things, we will miss the main thing. If we hold tightly, if we cling to old things, we will miss the main thing. And so just to be sure, that his readers, including you and I, would understand this. He repeats it again. He says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. See, here was the concern. The, the, the Judaizers, the people that were going behind Paul and saying, Here's what you need to do. You've got to follow the law of Moses. You've got to be circumcised. They, they were worried. If all you care about is love... If you make that the, the number one guiding ethic, won't that just be licensed to sin? Won't people just live however they want to and do whatever they want to do? And won't people just kind of live in one big giant hippie fest of love? Isn't that what it's going to lead to? I mean, won't people just use God's grace as a license to keep sinning? And every church has their version of that. Every church denomination, every follower of Jesus has some version of that where we kind of misuse God's grace and we go to church and we pray a prayer or we go to confession or we go to mass and we kind of empty our sin bucket and then we fill it up the next week so we can empty it again the following week. And every church, every religion, every denomination has some version of that. Followers of Jesus have some version of that. And Paul would say, look, if that's how you understand freedom, that, that freedom in Christ means that now I get to fill up my sin bucket every week because God's just going to forgive me? You don't understand freedom. If that's the way that you think of grace, then you really don't understand grace. So Paul says this, don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you want to keep the law? Here's what it comes down to. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is so powerful, this one command. And here's why. It actually comes from the book of Leviticus. It comes from their law of Moses. They had it the whole time. Paul goes, listen, you Jewish brothers and sisters of mine, the Jewish people, you had it right from the beginning. And it's not 613 laws and it's not even 10 commandments. It's just one command that gets to the heart of the entire law. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. It reminds me of uh, the movie The Wizard of Oz. If you've ever seen The Wizard of Oz, one of the creepiest movies of all time. Uh, But when you watch The Wizard of Oz, that should be an eight-minute movie. Right? Because there's this tornado, and she ends up in, you know, munchkin land. We represent the lollipop kids, you know? Weird. I don't know where this comes from. But then she gets these ruby red slippers, and she puts them on. And then the rest of the movie, she's trying to figure out how to get home. And it's somewhat anticlimactic. At the very end, they're like, oh, yeah, those slippers you're wearing, just click those together. You'll be back in Kansas. You're like, what? That should be an eight-minute movie. Get the ruby slippers. Like, that's your ticket home. You had them the whole time. Paul's going, guys, you had the secret the whole time. Love your neighbor as yourself. It wasn't about 613 laws. It wasn't even about 10 commandments. It really is this one command that gets to the very heart of what God is all about. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says, you had this the whole time. Love God, love your neighbor, and the rest is details. In fact, Paul would say, the way that you love God is by loving your neighbor. The way that you love God is by loving well the people created in his image. The temple model says, God, how are we doing? It's very, very vertical. And Jesus says, no, you want to know how we're doing? Look at the people around you created in my image. How are you treating them? Now, how can you know? See, you're like, okay, this is a great history lesson. Really appreciate that, professor. All right. (laughs) What does this have to do with us? How do we know that the temple model is in us? Because the reality is all of us have some things that we tend to hold on to. And when you have friends or neighbors or coworkers or family members who resist church and resist God and resist faith, most often they're not resisting Jesus. What they are resisting is some version that they were modeled or uh, they're resisting a way that they were treated or a bad experience that they had in a church setting or a bad experience they had with one of Jesus' followers because of things that we've held on to. That we think we're helping God with some of our legalism and our rules, but the reality is the minute you try to earn your way to God, you fall away from grace. And so what does it look like? A couple of quick questions and then we'll close. How can I identify the temple model in my own life? Do you ever wonder how close you can get to sin without actually sinning? That's temple model. That's an old thing. You're holding to that old thing, and it will cause you to eventually mistreat people because you're like, as long as I'm good like this, then I can go to the edge wherever here. And as long as, as long as God, as long as we're good, I can get right up to the edge without sinning. That's, worry, that's very vertical thinking. You're worried about where you stand with God and not about how it affects the people around you. The Jesus movement is horizontal. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, do you, do you ever feel more guilty about missing church or mass or confession than you have about how you treated someone at work? It's vertical. The Jesus movement's horizontal. Have you ever feared, and this is somewhat sensitive, but I'm going to bring it up. Have you ever feared for the eternal destiny of your child based on whether or not they were baptized? That's temple model thinking. See, when we celebrate baptism, and we're going to do that on Easter, but when we celebrate baptism, it's not a prerequisite to get to heaven. It's a celebration of the fact that you're already in God's family. It's not like you better do this so that you can get in. It's like, no, we're doing this to celebrate the fact that we're already in. We follow Jesus' example in water baptism. When you fail morally, whatever moral standards you have, and we all have our own version of that, whether it's scripture or you have some other standard, but all of us have some standard of morality that we uh, ascribe to and that we follow. And when you fail to meet your own moral standards, are you more concerned about what God would do to you than you are about the person that you sinned with? It's vertical. God, I want to make sure I'm good with you. I want to make sure I'm good with you. But what about the person that you're dealing with? How about this? Do you believe there is a ritual, some type of ritual or ceremony or church experience that somehow makes you right with God and removes your responsibility to make restitution with the person that you hurt? Like, God, I did this thing, I said this thing, and and it really wounded this person. So God, I'm coming to you. Will you please forgive me? And God goes, yeah, but they're the one you hurt. Go apologize to them. Go make it right with them. Yes, I forgive you, but it it can't just be this. It's got to be this. Do you, do other people's sins elicit in you feelings of superiority or feelings of compassion? 
When you see other people and, and you see a, a shortcoming in their life, does it make you feel morally superior or does it make you feel compassion for them? One is all about this. The other is all about this. Now, do, you, do your beliefs or your theology ever get in the way of love? If you answer to these questions, yes, as I know I have answered yes to some of these questions. It's old temple model thinking. And when we cling to those old things, we will miss the main thing, love. And for people who resist God and resist the church, it's not the love of Jesus that they're resisting. It is the old things that some of us have determined to cling to. And so, what if, as a church, what if we just decided and we just determined we are going to keep the main thing the main thing? What if we determined we are going to make sure that faith expressing itself in love is what marks Westbridge Church? How would that impact your life? How would that impact your family? How would that impact our community and our region? Let's be a church that does that. Let's be a church that is irresistible because Jesus and his love are irresistible. And let's keep the main thing the main thing. And then let's come back next week for part three of Irresistible. And if you're here and you're watching online or you're here this morning and you say, man, I've never, I've never heard this or I've never made the decision to be a part of God's family. Here's what you need to know real simply in a nutshell. The, the, the story of the scriptures cover to cover is God is building a family and he wants you in it. And God created every one of us from the first human beings to every one of us today to live and exist in loving community with God and with each other. And yet from the first human beings to every one of us at some point said, God, thanks but no thanks. I'm going to live life my own way. And it caused brokenness between us and God and brokenness between us and each other. And we don't even need Bible verses to tell us that. Well, our own life experience bears that out. That we feel a brokenness between us and God and us and one another. And so at the right time in human history, God sent Jesus into the world. And he started something brand new. And he did away with the temple model. He did away with this old covenant. He said, we're landing the plane on that. And there's, that's fulfilled. And now there's something brand new. And now you're invited to be a part of God's family. Not based on how you behave or checking the right boxes or keeping anything. But based on who God is, you are invited. So God showed us what, Jesus showed us what God's love is like. And in the ultimate expression of love, he allowed himself to be put to death on a cross. His body was laid in a tomb. And according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead. And that means there's more to this life than this life. And you and I have been invited to be a part of God's family. It is not based on you behaving your way there. It's based on who God is and what he's done. His undeserved grace. And if you've never said yes to that invitation, I want to give you the opportunity. Just say yes to this prayer as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times that I've walked away from you. And I thank you that you never walked away from me. And I want to say yes to the invitation to be a part of your family. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And help me to follow you. Not just, it's not just a belief that you exist, but God, I, I want to I live life the way that you say to live life. Because I trust that your way of living life is the best way. So I surrender my life to your way of living. And help me to do that as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, I pray for each and every one of us who are followers of you. I pray that you would help us to let go of old things and keep the main thing the main thing. That we would love well the people created in your image. And in doing that, that this would be a faith that is irresistible. We pray this in your name. Amen.